welcome to another episode of till the bottom so beauty and aesthetics it is all very subjective isn't it well perhaps it is not quite the truth we argue that there are certain standards of beauty that transcend cultures and are not just a mere social construction today it's just the two of us nacho and mitra and we explore the evolutionary angle to what humans and other species have evolved to find beautiful did that somehow make you curious well then let's start talking welcome to another episode of till the bottom we are your hosts mitra and nacho and this time is just the both of us uh, we don't have a guest this time but i hope that will be no impediment to have an interesting conversation for you Uh, the topic we want to talk about today is everything related to beauty, um, to what's pretty and what's ugly. And we will try to give like a global approach to this topic, meaning we want to talk about beauty as related to human affairs, but also give a more expansive overview of the topic that will necessarily delve into, for instance, yeah. how other species that are not that closely related to, to us see beauty or which kind of aesthetic sense they have or they lack. Um, so the spirits, I think, for this conversation, it's, it's mostly a naturalistic spirit. But we decided that we also want to make justice to the other side, let's call it like that, when the topic of beauty generally comes up, which is the more social constructivist approach to, to these kind of topics. Uh, I think probably the term or the concept that more clearly reveals what, what this uh, social approach uh, is, is explaining when, when we're talking about beauty is the concept of uh, standards of beauty. Mm -hmm. And I think most people listening to this might be very, very, very familiar with, with what standards of beauty mm -hmm. are when... Or might have heard this topic yeah. over and over. So uh, there are certain standards of beauty that is globally accepted. Yeah. So what do we mean by social? By, sorry, by by standards of beauty. What we mean by that is those markers in the opposite sex that are generally seen as attractive. So what are the things in females that are generally taken to be attractive uh, by mm -hmm. males and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And what we find is that there are some generalities that are cross-cultural, but there is also certain degree of uh, cultural variation. Yeah, in, flexibility, in, yeah. Mm, cultural flexibility in evaluating which particular physical markers are particular, particularly appealing to mm -hmm. the opposite sex. Um, Now, typically, the social account is that we basically are born blank slates and we have no preference yeah. for one way or another. Mm -hmm. So, there is no, there, there, there's nothing innate built mm -hmm. into, an, in, in, into our aesthetic sense. And if the culture was such that for some reason we were born into a place where uh, there was a preference for exuberantly obese people, yeah. then that's the that's what we would like. But the reason why we have the standards of beauty that that are familiar, for instance, the, the typical hourglass shape, yeah. in, in talking about, about, about females. Um, or big eyes. Or big eyes, or high cheekbones, mm -hmm. or like small chins, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of stuff, even certain hairstyles and so on. And then when you talk about males, uh, there are also standards, physical standards of beauty, like the V-shaped torso. You know, so, so you don't think these are socially constructed? Not for the most part, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they're socially accentuated by, by, yeah. by say, an ad-driven society at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, you are even more uh, uh, screening them down to narrower and narrower standards. Yeah. So, so, so the argument typically goes like this, which is uh, the reason why we like, why we have these preferences is because we are constantly bombarded with images that um, portray these, these people having mm. these particular traits, yeah. right? So the, you see ads for, for mm. bikinis, 
in the streets and they usually have this very yeah. uh, hourglass shaped uh, mm. body uh, with exuberant breasts, yeah. also exuberant behinds and a very thin waist mm. and so on. And if you look at movies, if you look at the, the best mm. paid actresses and best paid actors, yeah. they, are, they, they, have a, mm. they, they they're generally accepted to be beautiful mm. people, but the reason why we see them as beautiful is because we are constantly exposed to them as being these paragons of mm. beauty as portrayed by marketing, yeah. the movie industry. And so, so this is the, 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 the very social based argument, right? That the environment is pretty much defining our choices. Uh, and uh, with respect to beauty, um, everything is defined by the culture and nothing comes innately from inside. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and this, ex this debate extends further than that also, of mm -hmm. course, right? Because people talk about uh, like something like communism, uh, which they believe that everyone should be equal. So they said that this is how uh, everyone is supposed to mm -hmm. behave in a certain society. So they completely did not foresee that human behavior doesn't allow us for a completely communistic utopian world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's so. So there also, you assume that there was a blank state uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So, so I think in social sciences, it's a commonly held belief that everything is constructed, and and so humans can be conditioned and uh, driven in a, any direction they want mm -hmm. to. And here, the argument is with respects to beauty at this moment, specifically to that. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some uh, inherent. Yeah, uncontrollable urges. I think yeah, sure, sure, yeah. That that's basically the idea. Uh, and in defense of that idea, I think we can agree. You can we can agree with it to some degree, mm -hmm. because it is in fact true that there is some uh, social molding of our preferences to some degree, right? Mm -hmm. And actually, if you make like some kind of cross cultural studies. Uh, in terms of what different cultures find appealing, you'll see some extravagant differences, sure. right? Typical examples are these, I think, cultures in certain parts of Africa and actually also Southeast Asia, where women put like, you know, rings mm. to elongate their necks, yeah. their necks and they, they apparently see that as aesthetically pleasing. Uh, there are also the Maasai in, in, in Africa, Central Africa, uh, that kind of hung Hung yeah. from, their, from their ear, yeah. from the earlobes, all sorts of like earrings. Yeah, there are some weird, weird, uh, uh, like sexual preference related oddities that we find in different cultures, right? Yeah, there are many examples. Which has been accentuated, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. there are many examples of that, and I think that's unquestionable. Mm. But when you, in my opinion, uh, when you try to look at them from afar, let's say, mm -hmm. if you somehow put them into the correct perspective, uh, you would realize that the similarities between what different cultures consider beautiful are kind of more striking to the, these differences, mm -hmm. I, I would say. For instance, there are these many, many studies of uh, one of them quite recent where, mm -hmm. where people, I think, created, oh, if I remember correctly, it was like an online polling kind of system where people had to 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 come up with an image of the face of a, of a female or a male in different countries of what they consider uh, beautiful. And if, if you look over the map, so you get the you know the the mm -hmm. aesthetic ideal from Finland mm -hmm. and, and from Spain and mm -hmm. from Colombia and, and from the U.S. Mm -hmm. So there are differences. For instance, hair color, you know, mm -hmm. eye color. Maybe some variation yeah, in, skin, in skin color, kind of like that. Mm -hmm. But what you would not see mm -hmm. is if I showed you the, 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 the picture of the girl that comes from Finland mm -hmm. and then the picture that comes from, from, that comes from Colombia or from Argentina or from Japan or whatever mm -hmm. it is, you will not judge any of them as anything else than beautiful. They mm -hmm. will look, they will all look yeah. pretty to you. Mm -hmm. And if they don't quite satisfy your particular idiosyncratic yes. preferences, mm -hmm. you can completely accept that somebody that, that they that they might satisfy the preference of somebody mm -hmm. else. Yeah, it happens all the mm -hmm. time. Where you but but are these cues? Uh, in a way, it could be that um, we do select for fit people. So, so of course, when you say our uh, glass shaped bodies, mm -hmm. 
these are people who are taking good care of their body and they are um, like like of course if you uh, have someone who is very unfit and who is very fit mm-hmm. irrespective of the culture you will uh, say that that person is a bit more good looking than the other one yeah there's so, a, there's a cor- mm. there, there is there's, there's a correlation mm. between mm. what is aesthetically pleasing and fitness physical mm. fitness in the sense that you're talking yeah. about mm. i mean there's no no, qu- no question about that yeah uh but for i mean because we can talk about the relationship between fitness and beauty yeah. in a more uh, darwinian sense yeah, and yeah. i think we're mm. going to get into mm. that soon but before that uh there was another point i wanted mm. to make about uh, say uh the variation of standards of beauty and how i see them more as a reflection of a universal aesthetic uh, f- sense yeah. shared by most of mankind and then there are some regional variations on the yeah, central yeah. topics and I, i already went through some of these more like universal mm. standards universal standards of beauty which in terms of facial yeah. features have to do with the in, in fact we have course. beauty standards for other animals as well right mm-hmm. uh, so so if we uh, select we, we are allowed to choose uh, like a certain uh, species or a certain breed of dogs uh, you get like 20 of them i think more people will select the same set of peop- uh, dogs as more attractive than the other <laughs> so so yeah, beauty also, standards extend our taste <laughs> for beauty it would extend all oh, there there is a wide idiosyncratic vi- variation in that realm too right i mean there are some dogs that i just uh, have no reason to exist according to in my opinion that is <laughs> It, 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 no but i'm talking about the same breed uh, ah okay uh, yeah yeah i'm yeah. not talking about the, the of course visually the breeds, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. there are yeah. certain mm. aberrations that you yeah. can find in this mm. yeah. uh, mm. uh anyway there's something i wanted to say, mm. i guess what i wanted to say regarding beauty standards in humans um because they have been investigated for a long time actually already um the first study that i can that i am cognizant of was actually carried out by Uh, Darwin's cousin Francis Galton who was also a uh, fervent eugenicist so that's not he, he's more famous for that he's yes. certainly yeah. more, more famous I think for he that. coined the term eugenics yeah, yeah. He, he did but I mean putting aside these mm. these, these uh, execrable ideas that he mm. might have had at least for modern uh, moral standards he was a, a, a brilliant person he was very concerned in, in terms of his uh interest and, and and he actually contributed to science in terms of statistics uh, he was a very good statistician he was so his contributions were brilliant but a lot of his consequences were not yeah he's because, definitely because he really was uh, one of the forefathers of the eugenics movement which yeah. prevented a lot of people who were in the social underclass yeah he not meet and sure. then get um, uh, like um, castrated and stuff Yeah he 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 proposed if i remember like this was the 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 19th century uh, um, like late 19th century and early 20th century yeah when people when were prevented from uh, yeah meeting yeah, yeah. so so he was one of the instigators of that movement if i'm not i don't know you guys yeah yeah intellectually mm-hmm. speaking yes and, mm-hmm. and he did propose he did propose to for instance offer incentives mm-hmm. to smart people yes um or people in privileged positions mm-hmm. to selectively to, uh, improve to reproduce, the gene pool apparently. to reproduce so mm-hmm. so the, the the government or the state should give incentives mm-hmm. to um, overachievers or, or people mm-hmm. of, with with high intellectual achievements to to have more mm-hmm. babies so that let's say the people that are less lucky in that regard uh, would be you know contribute less but here it's people. about good genes so it's about utility Uh, yeah. the the but he also the, 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 the beauty component didn't come to the picture or that it, it came as a surprise mm-hmm. in his investigations because he was also concerned with how he wanted to know if there were some physical cues that were always present in the faces of for instance criminals so that you can look at faces of of people and determine something about uh, their propensity to commit crimes mm-hmm. and even their moral character and so on so these these, these ideas were extended later mm-hmm. later on so what he did he was he look, took many pictures of convicted criminals or he collected them mm-hmm. and uh, and was trying to look at features that were common across the board in all of these faces so he created for this like composite images from from the faces of all these criminals so let's say he kind of averaged out the the typical eye shape the typical nose shape and this is what the ai is doing much more efficiently these days yeah <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah 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 exactly 
So, and, and then he produced a composite image. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the general reaction to that composite image uh, by the people that contemplated it was uh, something that surprised him, which was that they people, for the most part, agreed that that, that face was looked beautiful. And that by averaging mm -hmm. out uh, faces of many, many, many people, you could actually produce faces that are pleasing. And this has been repeated many, many times. And um, in the actually using this, but, but how did he make these composite images? I don't know exactly which yeah. methods he used because yeah. he didn't have computers, yeah. so he must have. Been so you're composite. saying that uh, uh, like would it work with any set of the population? It has it has been done with with uh, samples of people from all over the world. So we can average out into a beautiful even with person. beauty queens, yeah. you know, of uh, different parts of the world, and then you generate using a computer mm -hmm. an average out image of a face. So and it's, it's a always really really attractive. Uh, photo that you get or uh, an average good looking uh, I, I think it's a really really attractive because really really attractive face sorry because almost unif unanimously the composite picture is mm. always judged to be more beautiful mm -hmm. than the separate pictures of the people that part that contributed to that composite mm -hmm. uh, and that is, has been replicated many many times and what that tells you well one way to look at it, I would, I would advance, is to say that it's, it's, it's a proof of the universal quality of some of the features that we find appealing. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, what, another way to, 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 to look at it is this. What you're doing when you're creating these composite images is that you're averaging out exaggerated features, yeah, right? Sure. So if somebody has a very large nose, somebody has a smaller nose, the average will always tend to be, mm -hmm. to look better. And the oddities are um, on the the, the, the the far side of the deviation, uh -huh. so you just get you kind of get, get rid of them, and you converge into a certain mm -hmm. standard that is generally appreciated as more beautiful than the and variation. That, that, that is precariously different to look at in different cultures, or is it surprisingly similar? So, so this average out uh, photos of criminals that this guy did get. Garden. 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 It uh, was uh, done for only people in the UK, right? In his case, I think yeah. so. I, I, mm -hmm. know, I'm not quite sure about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you know, this was, a, a, this was not what he was aiming for, yeah. for in his yeah. investigations. He was trying to figure out these key features which are only existing in mm -hmm. um, people having certain criminal traits. Yeah, yeah. That was his goal. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, there, were, there mm -hmm. was this surprising result mm -hmm. coming out from his... Mm -hmm. That, that his is a very convincing history. argument that we are kind of selecting for certain traits, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or that, or that we do find... what is pleasing to the mm -hmm. eye at least. Yeah. That there's a convergence mm -hmm. at least mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on the features that people tend to judge as beautiful at least. It's funny places. because visual cues are very easy to overlap and do these things. But mm -hmm. of course, there's also mannerisms. There's also uh, like cuteness... Uh, he but they are, also can be related. To so, so that also can be averaged into a very interesting personality, which we now just give it to the AI to create this, <laughs> <laughs> the most pleasing bot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. yeah, yeah. You get these 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 robots with huge eyes, no? Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Another, no, no, sorry, I got distracted. No, but, it's okay. It's yeah. okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Another example, and and this, another example of another experiment, and this goes completely against the notion of. Uh, socially constructed standards of beauty and I think it's, it's actually it's a demolish if not a demolishing result is a, it's a definitely very convincing result in favor of something else being important when we assess what's beautiful or what's attractive so this is about the body shape in, in females so mm -hmm. they gave mm -hmm. uh, but there's almost a social movement uh, going against yeah the, yeah we can get into grade, that yeah. I mean, that is one first to describe the experiment I don't know exactly the details of the experiment but the point is that blind men also converged on or, or they were rather unanimous in judging the hour, hourglass shape of women of women's bodies as the most preferable or appealing one so these people have never been exposed to movies or well they have listened to movies, but they have never seen the actors that appear in the, appear in the movies. They are not exposed to, to visual type of marketing also, or any kind of visual propaganda that promotes a certain so-called standard mm -hmm. of beauty. And still they have this preference that is very strongly manifested also in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the population of, of blind men. So then it becomes 
in my opinion, rather untenable to defend the social constructivist uh, position, at least to take it very, very seriously. Yeah. Again, we can agree. I think any reasonable person mm-hmm. would agree that there is a way to shape, you mm-hmm. know, like the rough edges mm-hmm. of your aesthetic preferences yeah. through... No, but social molding media. can take you a long way with things. Yeah. Like, like, like all, all, all these things that we have an acquired taste for. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm talking Absolutely. about even food uh, or uh, some other habits. Or beer. Or beer, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, is acquired. It's not something that... Uh, yeah. There's actual uh, experiments about that also uh, that are related to how we judge uh, people to be beautiful or not beautiful. And is that... I don't know. I don't know the details of the experiment, but turns out that people tend to judge progressively, progressively more beautiful, gradually more beautiful, the people that you get to know better, hmm. and you will start finding exactly. them, fi- start mm-hmm. finding them physically more appealing yeah, yeah. over time. The longer you, mm. uh, the, the longer you get to know them, obviously mm-hmm. you have to also like their character, right? Yeah. If you dislike their character, they probably then they can be the other one, yeah. I, I don't know about that, but I I, I, I would <laughs> no, find I it very plausible. It goes, yeah. <laughs> Sounds very plausible. Yeah. But you were saying, well, you were saying something else before. Ah, uh, what was it? What was it? Um, With the. I, I, I don't remember, but uh, uh, anyway, anyway, I think I want to move forward to an, another area. Yeah. So there is indeed a correlation, or there can be at least put it, sorry, it's, I, don't, I, I want to take that back. It's possible that there's a correlation between uh, fitness mm-hmm. and, and beauty. Yes. Right? That's where the back, yeah. And that's an idea that is very, very popular yeah. in the in the community of scientists that do this kind of research. Mm. So uh, biologists, people that, that uh, study evolution, people that look at uh, the ethologists, uh, all that kind of stuff. I think most of uh, the beauty-related studies are done on birds. Mm. A lot of to them start to start off because, with, because it is so glaringly obvious, mm-hmm. or, or not just birds, but also with certain insects. Uh, because I think the sexual dimorphism there is so so extreme. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, uh, I just want to try to put this into like a more take take the topic of beauty and and now transplant it to the nat- to the domain of the natural sciences. Yeah, and see what the natural sciences have to say about beauty. Yeah. Um, because there's, there's, it's an idea that has been floating around for a long time. Uh, what's the purpose of beauty in the context of evolution? How does it help? Yeah. Or does it have any role to play in the way uh, animals uh, yeah. take decisions about whom they want to mate with and who they want to procreate mm-hmm. with? And if there's some sort of aesthetic dimension to, to, to the way they choose mates, and how does that correlate or how mm. does that fit within the Darwinian, the Darwinian worldview? And the Darwinian worldview, by that you mean uh, a utilitarian worldview. Is that what you mean? Uh, like, as in like any trait that we observe in a certain animal um, um, has to have some utility argument on why that came about. Yeah. Okay. So maybe, maybe a good way to approach this would be through some like uh, historical revision about uh, the idea. Yeah. Of, of uh, how beauty is important, how, how does it fit into into the theory of evolution. And uh, the first thing to notice is that actually this idea has been there from the very beginning. Uh, even in the writings of, of Darwin, he recognized two major forces shaping uh, evolution. One of them is the most popular one, the, the well-known uh, natural selection. Uh, but he... Survival of the fittest. Yeah, basically, you know, to, 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 to synthesize, it, synthesize that in just one phrase. Uh, but he recognized as a second type of force driving also the evolution of the species, the uh, what he calls sexual selection. Actually, I don't know if he used those words, but mm. basically that's what he meant. But it was not in the origin of species, his original uh, the masterpiece, but no. in the second book, The Descendants of Man. The Descent of Man. Descent but, of Man. But w- wait, I... If I remember correctly, uh, there there is at least a couple of comments in the on the origin of species, also mm. hinting 
towards this other other force, the force of sexual selection in selection in, yeah. in shaping the evolutionary path of, of species. But he definitely doesn't go into into detail. Mm -hmm. or he doesn't mm -hmm. expound on his ideas on yes. this area in that book. He did that later. Um, and, and and actually he was of the opinion that there was some aesthetic sense built into into animals, including us humans, and that that's, that aesthetic sense um, was rather ar arbitrary. It was purely aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So there were some aesthetic yeah. references built within organisms that just made them like particular Treats. phenotypes. Of, of well, he didn't use the word phenotype, obviously, obviously, but uh, uh, you know what I, what I mean. Uh, yeah. So, so that there was an aesthetic origin of that. Yeah, yeah. That was, and here's a key point: that was not necessarily correlated with uh, what is now known as fitness. Yeah. Now this word fitness, yeah, it's used differently in in common parlance mm. uh, as compared to. To the language that evolutionary biologists employ. Violence. Yeah, you were using the words from the uh, century, like <laughs> violence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyways, uh, so, so so I think another key aspect uh, to this whole uh, um, chronology is that while uh, Darwin was coming up with this theory of evolution, uh, there was another guy who came up with the same idea mm -hmm. around the same time. Uh, Wallace. Uh, what was his first name? Mm, it's Arthur Wallace. Arthur Wallace. Yeah. He was, oh fuck. Yeah. yeah. So 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 he, he basically uh, came up with the concept, and because Darwin was someone famous, he sent his article to Darwin. Yeah. And then uh, Darwin realized that someone else is also coming in the same direction, so he decided he will publish both his uh, seminal paper as well as Wallace's uh, back to back, and mm -hmm. then uh, he gave his comprehensive book. Uh, yeah. Out in the audience. He sent a. So Wallace was doing his research in Southeast Asia, I think Indonesia, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. But it wasn't um, as extensive as, uh, no. or the amount of time spent by Darwin. But the whole point here is that when uh, Darwin proposed his second book, uh, uh, Descent of Men, mm -hmm. uh, Wallace uh, was severely critical of it. Yeah, uh, particularly about the about issue of the sexual selection. Um, because... And around that point, uh, basically Darwin uh, passed away. And then Wallace had the entire field uh, looking up to him, uh -huh. and he really propagated the idea. Propagated the idea that sexual selection is uh, a, a subset of uh, a natural selection, uh -huh. where it basically is just an honest indicator of a species uh, of an individual's fitness. Mm. It's a curious story because he ended up declaring himself to be more Darwinian than Darwin. Yeah, I was kind of like that was kind of a dick move. Yeah. I would say, <laughs> come on, yeah. <laughs> show some respect. Mm. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, uh, as you said, the, the idea he never took the idea of sexual selection seriously as relying on purely aesthetic mm. uh, preferences. Yeah. So he thought that whatever it is that we see attractive on the of, of the opposite in the in the opposite sex has to be directly correlated to the genetic fitness of that individual. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he didn't use the word genetic mm -hmm. because genes had not been... Well, there, the work of Mendel was already around, but I don't, I don't know if there no, was... No, it wasn't discovered then. Yeah, and anyway, the, the idea of, of the modern uh, discovery of a gene just came much, much later, and yeah. how they operate and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but this is the central point. The central point is that if you see a... Uh, and I will I will use the perennial perennial example of the pickup because it's the one that is always mentioned in this kind of discussions of, of, of beauty because obviously it has a very uh, extravagant. I think a average. person who has not seen the peacock uh, when for the first time you see the peacock with its tail completely expanded, uh -huh. it is quite an overpowering experience. Yeah, and yeah. Darwin had issues with that. You know, he couldn't he struggled to explain the the, the tail of the peacock in terms of. Uh, natural selection and he actually sent a letter to a friend of his as as a gray saying something like like and i'm paraphrasing here whenever i think about the yeah. peacock's tail it makes me sick mm. or something like that mm. because within the framework mm. of, evol of evolutionary theory with this and, uh, with its canonical mm. uh, natural selection it's very hard to explain mm. something as extravagant as that mm. right yeah. for several reasons 
one of them is very is that yeah. to maintain that kind of a tail mm-hmm. it's very expensive in yeah. terms of energy yeah. and in terms of nutrients and and the other one is that you're yeah, so visible to predators visible and clumsy mm-hmm. right i mean it's it, it has to be harder to escape a predator when you are dragging mm-hmm. that yeah. that tail behind you than when you're when you're not yeah so and of course you also understand why darwin was sick of it because here he comes up with a theory which is so so perfectly fitting all the pieces of the jigsaw and so simple and then you have these striking striking phenotypes in certain uh, species which you still just cannot get a handle for from the the from the, the basic theory of evolution that from from the, natural selection yes so then but if you take into consideration um there is that there is original thoughts on sexual selection then there's no problem because They, then mm-hmm. you understand that there's another component mm-hmm. to the story, which is just uh, mm-hmm. aesthetic preferences. Yeah. And then you can explain many, many other things that mm-hmm. natural selection cannot explain mm-hmm. on itself or it's problematic. Yeah. And now the controversy arose because Wallace mm-hmm. would not take that mm-hmm. as, a, as, a, as a valid theory. Yeah. He had to somehow make this... He, he had to square the circle. Yeah. Uh, he had to find a way to explain this extravagant appendages and displays or physical displays of, of beauty in, in whatever you might find them mm. as being honest yeah. advertisers of the inherent genetic fitness of the organism yeah. obviously that implies that the opposite sex of what of whichever animal you're talking about has a way to know that mm. has a way to infer from purely mm. uh, visual or, se- or sensorial cues In this case, for in this case, for example, the pigeon looks looks at the tail of, of different uh, peacocks, and what she's actually seeing it's not just this uh, panoply of colors and mm. this attractive display, mm. uh, but somehow calculating the, the the fitness or the health. Uh, yeah. Component so the quality of the, of the genetic material mm. of the of the peacock, that's what she's seeing, and that. Every appendage, every marker of beauty in every animal is mm-hmm. actually that. Um, then later on, well, I, I'm not sure about how to proceed here because uh, I don't know if I sh- should go through a, a strictly chronological uh, timeline or or give you a, just just get Zahavi. In, yeah, so that, that was what I mm-hmm. what I was yeah, going to figure that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this idea then gained credit. Again, and actually, you know, it, it ruled or it kind of dictated the way in which scientists understood evolution and the evolution of phenotypes yeah. for a very long time, even until today. And there's a school of thought, uh, or there's a name for that kind of school of thought, which is like the adaptationist uh, view of evolution, mm. which is, it's, it, it doesn't only encompass uh, beauty, but everything. It says that whatever phenotypical uh, manifestation you see in an, in, in an individual mm. has to necessarily be an adaptation. It has to be there for some reason. And that reason has to be connected to the fitness of the individual, to the genetic quality of that individual. Yeah. So it's, it's all-encompassing. And because it's all-encompassing, it also includes uh, beauty markers. Uh, and, and that's kind of the dominant view in the field as far as I get. Uh, this idea got further traction from the from the handicap principle of Ahmad Sahabi. He was yeah. an ornithologist, an Israeli ornithologist. And uh, again, going back to the peacocks example, what he said is that it's not only that, uh, it's not only the case that the, the tail of the peacock is a, it's an honest indicator of the genetic fitness of the peacock, but it's actually good because he's showing the females that Look what I can do. Look mm. how fit I am. Mm. That I, that I can wield this tail, which is expensive, in the full sense of the word. Yeah. Of the word, and it's in principle diminishing my 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 chances of propagating my genes because it's making it harder for me to escape predators. Yeah. Uh, because it's taking all these resources that I need to keep on consuming to maintain it and so on and so forth, and I still. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm basically I'm, I'm still around just just mm-hmm. watch me so that tail becomes a literal handicap mm-hmm. a kind of a test that is that the, that that the individual is passing yeah. all the time mm-hmm. 
And but uh, there's just one thing that popped yeah. in. Uh, it it's still, uh, of course, it's like a very elaborate, uh, like um, manifestation of a specific trait. But how this trait got uh, elaborated upon, and not some other trait, mm-hmm. even if you use an adaptationist view of evolution, that is random, right? Mm-hmm. Why the tail, and why not the the the, the beak or mm-hmm. the so so there is uh, you still don't explain that why a certain specific feature yeah got selected for yeah well but, the first hmm. you want you want to say something else about no no. It? The first thing is uh, to, to, to notice about, about that, I would say, is that, yeah, I mean, that, that's true when you focus on the peacock, as we have been doing. But when you look at the whole uh, biosphere mm. and all the animals that inhabit the biosphere, mm. you will see different that species get these different species mm. get different exuberant parts. Yeah. So, yeah, you do see... No, but, but this exuberance in a certain trait um, mm-hmm. is still a random uh, thing. For yeah, that specific species. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, that's I think then this would be a good moment to introduce the Fisherian, the Ronald yeah. A. Fisher view yeah, yeah. Uh, about uh, beauty markers, mm-hmm. um, which is precisely that. Mm-hmm. That it's quite possible. I mean, and, and he just worded this. You know, yeah. he, he had this idea and he expounded it on on, on words. And his idea was that whatever exuberant trait you see in a, in an in animal can be explained in the following following manner so it might start at its onset when they say that the tail of the of the peacock is becoming somehow a little bit longer for whatever reason or more colorful mm. or, or whatever it is mm. it's possible that at the beginning is an honest indicator of the fitness of the health of that individual uh, for instance uh, by by showing to the females that the Mm. This individual is free of mm. tail parasites yeah. or something like that. It could um, be that or it could have some survival strategy also. Mm-hmm. Like it could be that you get longer legs because you're running. Then initially it just helps you to run faster. Yeah. After a point that gets selected towards a different direction. Mm-hmm. So there, there are two different pressures, right? When uh, natural selection is happening for a certain species, one is uh, with respect to... So, so there are two primary things, right? Survival... Mm-hmm. Um, and mating. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so there are two different pressures. The propagation of yeah. The so, so it could be that a certain trait got accentuated or selected for for the survival aspect of it, but then it uh, became an honest indicator towards the the sexual aspect of it. Yeah. So the aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of Fisher's idea. Mm. It's possible that at the beginning, any of these exuberances can be explained in typical uh, Darwinian terms. Let's mm. say in, in terms of fitness. In terms of natural selection. But within any given population, there will be mating preferences, right? And this mating preference by, will dictate, in this particular case, how the females choose their partners. Mm-hmm. And because there will be variation there, this will kind of start on some sort of feedback, feed, feedback loop where the mating preference itself, the existence of the mating preference itself, will be the driver Mm. Of the phenotypical manifestations of the males, I don't mm. know if uh, that that makes sense or it's probably not quite clear. The, sense, the, the, the idea is this: so there's there's a different there's a range of preferences. Yeah. Let's say some females sp- start to like slightly longer and longer tails, and they will mate with males that have longer and longer tails, and this will kind of kick off a yeah. runaway process. For yeah. the tails to keep on growing generation exactly. after generation after generation. Until it becomes a disadvantageous trait with respect to something else. With, with respect to natural selection. So there yes. has to be like a balance. Mm. Uh, but before, before getting there, because that also would involve the work of other scientists, uh, mm. it's a, there, there's a tricky part here, which is when a female is selecting peacocks with a long tail... They are also also selecting the genes of the mothers of those peacocks. Yes. Right? Because that means that for that peacock to exist, the mother had to had to have chosen another peacock that also had a long yeah. a long tail. Mm. And that further spreads over the population and further changes gradually the gene. Mm. Right? So it's this like an indirect advantage for the genes that code for long tails in the in the case exactly. of peacocks. 
and that is what uh, selection by mm-hmm. natural means is all about right yeah but this yeah. cannot go on forever uh so that's that's fisher's idea and and how do you contrast that with sahavi mm. sahavi's uh, handicap principle mm. um then we need to take into consideration the work of two other scientists one is lande and kirkpatrick and they kind of grasped the ideas of fisher and grounded them on a on a more solid mathematical mathematical footing mm. and they did m- mathematical modeling of fisher of, of fisher's ideas and they what they obtained as a result was that there is a landscape world if you look at a single trait in this case again the peacock's tail mm. you will get, you will get like a line like a function that will signal all the equilibrium points mm. equilibrium points sorry where having this exuberant tail will balance out or, sorry will will also be compatible with the typical natural selection that natural selective approach of uh, or the fitness mm. of the of the individual uh and in the case of sahabi uh he doesn't predict that because the handicap principle if you take it far enough mm. it becomes a zero sum game right the tail cannot keep on growing and growing and growing and growing mm. indefinitely because at some point it will balance out the gains in fitness that it might yeah. confer so yeah. it becomes like a zero zero sum game mm. and then you're in a cool de sac in evolutionarily speaking mm. the point is of all this discussion is that there are two views one of them which says that everything related to beauty is just an indicator of genetic fitness and that's how animals choose uh, or how they determine what's beautiful because yeah. they have some way to see through the external phenotypical trait yeah. and evaluate the genetic the genetics of the individual or that it just so happens that there are there's something like an aesthetic sense built in animals and uh, and that aesthetic sense implies some mating preferences based purely on well if I know the way to say it but what animals like and enjoy aesthetically speaking yeah and that's a very controversial thing to say in the field of evolutionary biology because that mm-hmm. well it can take us into all sorts of you know yeah, yeah. philosophical debates mm-hmm. whether animals have mm-hmm. internal mental states and they know and what this aesthetic uh, taste um, doesn't have any utility component to it so so it's not like uh, they are unknowingly selecting for something it is mm-hmm. purely purely random Or, or, or somehow got selected for it, it might have started as non random mm. but then it becomes mm. well i don't know if random is the, is the right word but uh, but it, then then it's just grounded on purely aesthetic just in aesthetics mm-hmm. and and uh, there there is this uh, orthologist richard prom who wrote a book the evolution of beauty and he talks very extensively about this and uh, well actually he 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 got me sold on the idea of animals having an aesthetic sense because he because he didn't believe in that beforehand. I I found the ideas of Sahavi and uh, others that that mm. other, other evolutionary biologists that had similar similar ideas. I found them very compelling because uh, they they are very. I don't want to say the fitness based argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's 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 just. because that because it's very nice. innately a lot of scientists like i think the scientific world you there's the problem there that we tend to be utilitarians mm-hmm. mm. i think utilitarianism comes very hand in hand with the way education systems have worked so, so i think me also uh, like as soon as i clapped up the idea of evolution mm-hmm. um, i have been looking for utility in each and every possible traits Uh-huh. Um, and, and trying to find some sort of a Darwinistic argument on why a certain trait got selected for, uh-huh. uh, instead of just saying that certain things uh, there is just a, a random choice event that just started off that procedure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. Uh, I think but but on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, there 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 are other things also, right? Like certain uh, traits, uh, um, like um, like large eyes. Uh-huh. Uh, we we have accidentally uh, started liking that because babies have lies with large eyes right so there is some um, like um, 
We sell it for that, for instance, in puppies or, or in, exactly. in, in pets. Yeah, we in general have a preference for mm-hmm. large eyes because babies, the pupil, the, the size doesn't change, but the eye size changes. So for, for, for small babies, the eyes are really large and we find that cute and adorable. And that is some sort of a priming that our genetics does on us taking good care of kids. Mm-hmm. And that certain feature we have selected for. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so that is an adaptive feature which got selected for sexual selection, mm-hmm. for instance. Yeah. What I want to say is that the adaptation is view is very attractive because mm-hmm. because uh, it it's an it's easily compatible with natural selection and it has this sense of, of just fitting very nicely within the framework of natural selection. You don't have to do any more work or find any other mm-hmm. driving force uh, channeling evolution. Just that, and it's all mm-hmm. nicely fitting there. But then, when you look at particular examples, when you look at the details of uh, of how sexual selection actually works, and it doesn't, be, it, doesn't it becomes less and less compatible with mm-hmm. the idea that the honest advertising uh, hypothesis, because several reasons. But one of them, I would use an example that gives uh, that Richard Prom gives gives in his book about his research. Mm-hmm. So he's studying mannequins, which yeah. are uh, a, a family of birds. They live from south, from southern Mexico to northern Argentina. There are 54 different species of these mannequins. And what they have in common is that the males are exuberant in their coloration. Like the, their plumage is, has exuberant colors and they perform very intricate uh, mating rituals that the females just look at them, enjoy them, mm. and based on their performance and their looks, mm. select for them. Now, something first, something that is interesting about them is that while the males look from different species look rather different from one another, mm. all the females look the same. Yeah. You know, all the females look the same. They have no need to evolve visual uh, exuberant uh, physical traits yeah. because they are the selectors. Yeah. They are what is called a polygynous Which kind of species. Which is uh, our patriarchal world you find in space. Yeah, it's, it's a turn on its head. Mm-hmm. So, so it's a polygynous species. So, what that means is, uh, I don't know you want. No, go for it. What, what, uh, mm. what a polygynous species means is, uh, or how a polygynous species behaves, is that in which there's almost no parental invest. There's actually no parental investment from from the from the father, mm. and the female is in charge of hatching. In this mm. case, we were talking mm. about first. They are hatching the offspring, and when the offsprings when the offsprings are born, they will tend to their care, they, mm. they, they will feed them, and they will be completely in charge of turning those offsprings mm. into viable adults. Mm. The, ma- the males will not contribute mm. further. They just so, basically so contribute... So the females their... are the alpha, beta, gamma. Yeah. Uh, the males are just trophies. Yeah. So, so they are just there displaying their uh, specific there's only, trait. There's only one resource yeah. that they contribute with. And, and this is not sperm. just with birds, it's also with insects. Uh, with a large number of insect species, you find that the the, the 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 male of the species has some sort of innate attractiveness and diversity of uh, different beauty traits yeah. which, which strangely even humans find beautiful um, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah and, and, and that's pretty much the role like in insects they, there's even even often once the mating is done it, the purpose of life for the yes, male is over they, 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 are, they, are, they are eaten by the, the, the females and then yeah, they are done that's it, that's it. End of a life cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah mission accomplished yeah. from but, their perspective. And then, but yeah, so, so so they are just there for that purpose, right? To to the, supply sperm. Yeah. That's the ultimate so so, of so for life. these animals, if their uh, survival uh, is kind of stable, like their um, uh, whatever nutrients you need or whatever mechanisms you need to survive your predators and whatever nutrients you need to um, to 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 grow up and be uh-huh. uh, a, a mature individual, uh, then their only selection pressure is sexual. Yeah. It's only guided by whether or not the female in the species is selecting you. Uh-huh. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, here, again, there are many directions that I, I would like to explore, but I'm focusing on the case of mannequins. Uh, and I'm trying to select which one I, I, I want to explore first. Yeah. The first is the what is called aesthetic radiation. So, because of their lifestyle, 
because because of the very big differences in parental investment from the female side to the to the to the father side, mm-hmm. the males started to vary in in the way they look mm-hmm. very obviously and also in the rituals that they perform, and because. Possibly, this all of these mannequins originated from a single parent species at some point yeah. back in the in the history of their phylogenetic tree. Yeah. There was already a, a certain uh, a certain variation of mating preferences in mm-hmm. the in this seminal population from the females. So they started liking different features, different females like different features features of the males, mm-hmm. and then because of these different pre- different preferences. That created a spe- different species. speciation events. This is called aesthetic radiation. When you have a speciation event, this is the creation of two or more different species mm. uh, based solely in mating preferences. So this is a strong case so that's for sexual es- selection. Aesthetic, uh, aesthetic radiation. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's a strong case for 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 sexual selection being the being in this particular case the driving yeah, mechanism yeah. for evolution. One reason why that is possible in this particular uh, family of birds is because they feed on fruits and that's kind of very important. If, for instance, they happen to feed on insects, it will be much more difficult for a single parent to provide for their offspring mm. because insects don't want to be eaten. You know, they, they, they will develop Strategies. strategies to escape. They will become poisonous. Mm. They will camouflage. Um, they're basically just mobile. I mean, yeah. insects don't want to be eaten. But fruits are the complete opposite. Fruits want to be eaten. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's beneficial for the for the, the plants that produce fruits yeah. that they are eaten by some other organism and then that other organism goes, you know, it's doing their life and the, then just basically the defecates the seeds somewhere mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. And that's good for the plants. Uh, but, and this is the particular family of birds that lives almost entirely on fruits. So that allows the females to kind of, you know, have this must be way. mapped uh, also by um, biologists that uh, species which are uh, fruit eating, the divergence is much larger than insect eating. Uh, and in, in terms of aesthetics? Yeah. Well, in, at least in this case, uh, that was definitely the case. Mm-hmm. I mean, there might, again, you need to have several factors. You need to have a certain lifestyle that allows for that. In this case, being a fruit eating mm-hmm. species, and this that that is it, it ties back to Fisher's idea that in any given population mm-hmm. there will be mating preferences uh, that vary among the population. And what are the uh, predators for birds? Larger birds, right? Yeah, and uh, I've, because lines, because birds cats, have kind of uh, kind of nailed uh, a perfect survival strategy of escaping predators mm-hmm. in by flying. Right? Mm-hmm. So, so only other things that can fly can basically predate on them. No, but also cats. Cats. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, felines. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. The monkeys do that. I have mm. no idea. Anyway, and, and anyway, now I, I want to go into details mm. of the mating rituals of this, yeah, yeah. Uh, of this, of the male mannequins, because this will reveal a point against the case of honest advertising, yeah. which is. Uh, there is there there is this particular there are two species of mannequins I forgot their particular names but what they do they do some kind of a dance so they they kind of fly high then they come down and they do like some mm-hmm. arc jumping and then they end their performance either with pointing their beaks upwards or mm-hmm. with or, or with pointing their tail upwards mm-hmm. so now the performance is essentially the same. In both of the yeah. species, you know, there's no difference other than the final position. Yeah. That's pretty much it. And uh, if you want to correlate that, if you want to make that square with the idea that there must be something, some utility. some utility to this, there must be something to that final posture of the birds that is telling the females that, you know, I'm a genetically fit individual, mm. then it becomes a very difficult case to make it seems rather just arbitrary to say mm-hmm. that right it's the performance is the same it's just a difference in in in, in position in, fi- in final posture yeah. so that gives more credence to the to the other idea that there might be just some aesthetic preferences built within the females of this particular species mm-hmm. um yeah so that's the case of these birds i don't know there are many other examples you know mm-hmm. and, and even examples where you can make the case that Sexual selection might be driving the species into into a dead end. 
yeah. into extinction. So what was this uh, mannequin which developed such strong muscles in their wings? It, it that, bones, uh, yeah. And the whole point was to basically get a certain frequency when they flap their wings yeah. to make a certain sound which is pleasing to the the female. That's called the species. club winged mannequin. That's the club winged mannequin. And, 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 and did it almost drive itself to extinction? That's very crazy uh, when you think about it. Yeah. yeah. This in, in terms of conventional, conventional natural selection because... Exactly, because to, to create that sound, the kind of bones that you have to develop, uh, you basically lose your flight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So these, these birds, part of their mating ritual is to vibrate their wings, as you said. You know, to create some sound based yeah. on vibration of like, you know, bones basically mm -hmm. scrapping each other. Mm -hmm. And the heavier the bone, the more massive it is, the, the louder the sound is and the more attractive it is for mm -hmm. the females. So the females tend to select for those that are um, have the heavier bones. Mm -hmm. But the bones become so heavy that these birds are losing their ability to fly, to mm -hmm. fly, sorry. And because they're losing their ability to fly, they are more liable to become extinct because they are an easier catch yeah, for yeah, predators. Yeah. And you see, you see an almost complete decoupling of sexual selection and From natural selection. Yeah. Something that cannot be explained mm -hmm. with the adaptationist worldview, yeah, the, yeah, the, the adaptationist yeah, yeah, view of yeah. evolution. So it's very curious. Anyway. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so, so I guess to some extent we are both convinced that there is a predominant uh, se uh, evolutionary pressure which is completely sexual mm -hmm. like uh, based on mate choice which can be decoupled from uh, adaptive uh, selection yeah yeah this is yeah. a good example yeah. of yeah. that mm -hmm. and uh, you know birds yeah, yeah. yeah birds give us a lot of indicators indicators on uh, yeah. Like how evolution... And it gets even... In, in fact, Darwin came up with his theory looking at finches, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but before before we uh, kind of close the circuit and go back to humans, mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to make a point uh, with respect to this decoupling, right? Uh, so, so any species when it has like serious struggle for survival... Uh, like uh, when it um, either cannot get its uh, food source... Or it cannot get its, um, you know, like it's getting predated very easily. So then all the traits that are getting selected for are adaptive. Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, we are right now talking about yeah, animals, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, which are uh, sexual uh, uh, species, not mm -hmm. asexual species. I'm just talking about, uh, sure, sure, of course, right now the entire discussion is about Yeah, what you're saying is that there are certain times and circumstances, environmental circumstances that yeah. push very strongly mm. in favor of traditional natural selection. Exactly. You know, when every little variation, mm. Mm. every little mutation mm. might result. Mm. On and a it, it could be something like an ice age or like a seven cold winters. Yeah. E even that could trigger something very, very serious, which uh, selects for certain adaptive traits. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, say after those seven winters of cold, um, then there comes a period of uh, like abundance with yeah. respect to your food source or your predator is off to other things mm -hmm. uh, then uh, you are in some sort of a stable equilibrium so so then uh, uh, of course uh, some of these features which got adaptively uh, accentuated certain traits um, becomes more likable to the females so, mm -hmm. so sexual um, sexual selection can basically take go away from it yeah. so, 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 so in, in a way stable equilibrium where you have certain amount of uh, adaptive pressures and certain amount of sexual pressures. These things go hand in hand. But suddenly if the, there's an absolute uh, Interruption. season of abundance, so you have everything and you're in absolute luxury, then uh, the, the sexual pressure becomes much, much more stronger than the adaptive pressures. And then uh, you end up selecting or, or, or running away with certain traits mm -hmm. which make you less adaptive. Yeah, and uh, so 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 it's it's all about the stability and the relationship the species has with respect to the environment. Yeah, and respect to their their social habits. Yeah, so it's, it's both yeah. both mm. both factors. So so, so you can go in both directions. I think most species are somewhere in the middle where they both the pressures are kind of going hand in hand somehow, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's very hard to say if this trait is sexually selected or adaptively selected. Uh, but with uh, species like the birds, you get these obvious examples. Yeah, uh, especially when they're polygynous. Yeah. 
especially when they're polygynous. There's a, a, a stronger yes. decoupling. Yeah. Because because they, they, they the, the different sections just don't need exactly. each other. Exactly. The they just don't, don't need, need each other. Yeah. They, they, they mm. only need to meet, mm. to copulate. Mm. That's it. The females only need to visit the males to get their sperm. Mm. Period. Yeah. You know, yeah. End of the relationship, mm. end of the interaction. Yeah. So that allows for mating preferences to be the most important driving force for evolution, in particular the evolution of the males and their behavior and well, in this case not, not their behaviors, mm. but their appearance mm. and mm. their well, their behaviors too, in terms of yes. like having these mm. exuberant mating rituals. That get even crazier mm. when you talk about bower birds, but I don't know if you want to talk about that, maybe we just No, we just skip that. We skip uh, the bower birds, but and let's get whoever, back to humans. Yeah, uh, who whoever is watching just just uh, check them out because yeah. they're, they're they have amazing. a fascinating amount array of uh, traits that they have developed yeah uh, over the evolution and <laughs> as we go move towards the humans uh, we need a human break let's have a break now yeah. so uh, before the break uh, uh, what we were basically we, we kind of established is that uh, sexual selection for certain traits uh, which kind of run away uh, is something related to the the, the, the the interaction between the male and the female in that species. Mm-hmm. So, so we, you you pointed out that uh, birds, uh, the, the, at least the examples that we were talking about, are polygynous, uh, mm-hmm. uh, where essentially the male have no no uh, zero uh, parental investment yeah. in the raising of the offsprings. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so now putting it back to the context of humans, because. Um, it could very well be that sexual selection is something which pertains to these kind of uh, animals where the entire purpose of the male uh, interaction with the female is uh, uh, the, 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 the sexual um, um, trait that they are trying to... The mating part. To, to display, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, and nothing beyond. But if you look at uh, most of the other species, uh, like mammals, for instance... Uh, you see that there are different dynamics and in, uh, different kinds of interactions which manifest out of uh, maybe uh, uh, raising an off- offspring or survival strategies they need to do as a community, as a group. Mm-hmm. So, uh, is uh, something like sexual selection uh, uh, a very, very strong pressure or strong force with other species mm-hmm. and specifically with humans? With, with humans, it gets even more stranger because the amount of investment that the male has to up raising the offspring is probably the most in any species. Or yeah. are there other? Yeah. Maybe 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 there are also some examples. Again, you'll find in birds. But, uh, <laughs> also in birds, there are certain birds. There are certain, the, 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 certain few yeah. cases, but if you, if at least we we limit ourselves to primates, yeah. then for sure. Yeah. As far as I know, yeah. there might be some yeah. monkey. So, so this this is a question. Uh, of of course, I also uh, read through the this very nice uh, book by Richard Prum on the evolution of beauty, where he just mainly focused on birds and then extrapolated everything to mm-hmm. human behavior. Adapted it mostly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so keep coming up with a lot of interesting hypotheses, but what. I got the feeling, uh, just thinking about it, was maybe a parental investment is a, a dampening force on uh, sexual selection. Here's the thing. I, I I want to agree with that, as you stated it. Yeah. But I think it's just that sexual... Sex, first of all, sexual selection is active all the time in every species. It has a different level of, of uh, transcendence, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's always there mm. to some degree. Mm. Um, now, what you're saying, if I understand it correctly, is that it becomes, it's a lesser form driving evolution in the mm. case of humans evolution as, of compared to, as compared to birds. Yeah. And now, I would agree if we make the distinction that sexual selection in humans, it's not so much focused on physical traits, but it's focused on behavioral traits. Yes. So probably whatever so is lost... So with respect to physical traits, yes. Yeah. Whatever is lost mm. from the bird... Because mm. the bird, the birds, in the, the, the family of the mannequins, mm. uh, they just don't care at all about the behavior of each other. Mm. They just meet this single mm. time, you know, have their, their, their mm. mating season, it, and that's pretty much mm. it. Then, then it doesn't matter how the male behaves towards the mm. female anymore because they just don't encounter each other anymore. Mm. 
But as you were saying, in the case of humans, there's the parental investment from both uh, sexes is more equitable. It's still more in the case, for the case of females. In, in, but in fact, in, in fact, I have a feeling that uh, somehow the sexual display of rituals might have even uh, take, taken uh, turned the table a bit. Uh, mean? In terms of uh, like all the focus of beauty is on the woman and not the man. This is a question I always had when I, uh, as a kid, when you go to the zoo, <laughs> because that's uh, in big cities in India, you don't see birds, you don't see animals unless you go to the zoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you go to the zoo and then you go through the whole section of birds, you see the peahens are ugly, the 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 the, the male uh, uh, gets all the flashiness, uh, gets all the flashiness, and the <laughs> female are so They're boring and ordinary, and right? Rapid. And and. You then think why? Why in humans it's the other way around? Physically, Physically. because yeah, uh, uh, and also the, uh, the the society pressure uh, on being beautiful is not at all on the men. Like men, if in their uh, maybe even they're in their forties, if they have a belly and they are basically earning enough, mm-hmm. that's more than enough. Mm-hmm. For women, they still have that pressure that they need to still look attractive. So, so the, the the tables have almost turned, uh, uh, yeah. And, and something with our interaction between the sexes uh, and our behaviors with respect to each other has made the table turn in, in comparison to what happens with mm. birds. In terms of physicality, yes. Yeah. That that's this is completely ignoring mm. behavior, right? Mm. I mean, the, you're not taking behavior into account mm. because you can totally make the case that females have shaped male behavior over generations sure. in a more or mm. less equivalent. I'm way. talking about physical yeah. beauty. Mm. I get it. But uh, but what that tells you is contrary to the popular opinion that males, human males, are not choosy. Actually, we are. When we compare ourselves to other primates, to mm. other apes in particular, yeah, they just whatever. don't care. Yeah, yeah. They just don't care. Chimpanzees, our closest. Yeah, we need alcohol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, or <laughs> uh, or our closest cousins, which mm. are chimpanzees. Mm. Bonobos and gorillas a little bit further mm. further away from the, in mm. the phylogenetic tree. Are we closer to chimpanzees than bonobos? I think it's kind of the same as far as I know. Mm. I mean, I mean, unless some you mm. know more like modern research mm. yeah. decides one mm. way or the mm. other. Uh, anyway, the point is that first of all, the females in chimpanzees and gorillas. I'm wrong, I'm ruling out bonobos for just for the time being because it's uh, have a very complicated other eggs. It's a, diff- a little different, but I think yeah. this these remarks will also apply to bonobos. So, but anyway, they they have an estrus period, which is the period in which they are fertile. Yeah, and and it's is it's advertised in a yeah. visible way so that the males of the species know when the, the female is fertile and it's time to mate. Now, when that happens, go- male gorillas and male chimpanzees just do not care. Yeah, they they don't look at true. anything that we might approximate as a beauty marker in the females to decide, yeah, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe, you know, uh, I'm not so attracted to that one. I, I'm going to pass. Yeah. They, yeah. they don't have that choosiness. Yeah. So in comparison to them, relative to them, yeah. human males are way more choosy than that. Yeah. Right? I mean, first but of but all, of because... Of course, in, in case of gorillas and chimpanzees, then... Uh, the women are choosing. They are making the choice. No, and, no, and they no, can no, no, no. no. They can come up with different strategies, right? Like, but but for the most part, no. They don't choose. No, no. They gorillas. just say let. Gorillas have har- harems. You know, they, okay. there's a, an alpha male mm. and a exactly. So so so, so group of. I, I think there is a hierarchical structure where the alpha male is making sure he's copulating about fifty percent of the time. Yeah, it, there's a, there's a, there are differences between gorillas and chimpanzees. Yeah. Like in the case of gorillas, there's this, this alpha male, and he's just basically having it, his mm. way with all the females of the yeah. group. You know, he has a personal harem, and yeah. that's it. Which means that the females are not very promiscuous, mm. or almost not promiscuous at all. They don't so mate with other males. Ah, so right? the other males don't get anything. No. And chimpanzees are different. They, they no, 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 wait, wait. So, so in gorillas, the other males have to sneak in and somehow no they have to no they have to dethrone the alpha male they need to get into the position so, of so how male. do they extend their they, genes no they, it, are, they it don't just have has chance. to be physical so that's why they have grown yeah, yeah, yeah. they grown basically these big features. their sexual dimorph- dimorphism there's a correlation between sexual dimorphism yeah. and the and the promiscuity of, 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 of females 
and 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 mm-hmm. asset, which so, so, so with gorillas uh, 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 the, the the sexual trait that gets selected for in men is violence or strength strength mm-hmm. yeah, i don't know i would know I, i don't know if i would call that sexual trait but uh, but in principle yeah. that's a sexual strategy you have to be thrown the, yeah. the, the so alpha it's a certain so, so that that is what gets selected for yeah. you have to be the most powerful in some intimidating yeah, and violent yeah. so so that can be behavioral as well mm. yeah mm. not so much towards other females in this case i guess mm. but towards the ma- it's a male male competition exactly exactly you know but but that's also i would say sexual selection indirect indirect but indirect. still because this is not if this is not natural selection related uh, strength like uh, somehow uh, the 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 the, the selection a, for strength here uh, is through sexual pressure and not adaptive pressure in i would i would i would stress the part indirect because yeah. it doesn't it does it doesn't It doesn't reflect indirect interactions between the sexes, but it's a form of male of male comp- male to male competition for access to females. So, mm. sort of. Now, in chimpanzees, it's different. In chimpanzees, the females when they are in in estrus, they are very very promiscuous. Mm. They would mate basically with anyone that is around. Mm. Now, the alpha male has a better access to yeah, females yeah, just yeah, because yeah. of its social position position as mm. alpha male. But beta males can also get access to females by kind of tricking them into mm. having sex. And, and, and the whole point here is that the the female can confuse all the males she had sex with that you have some parental investment to the kid, and that's why you don't kill it. Mm, as long as there's the the social structure of the group is stable. Yes. That that probably you know infanticide does not happen very much. It but when the, no no but whenever there's a that an upturn so, so 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 let's just point out that in a lot of primate species uh, male infanticide uh, is quite common it's very common mm. so one of the, the the driving the most important causes of child and mortality. why male and not female because you want to because reduce I, your competition yeah yeah you want, so it's very important in in many animals and even including human human to secure to have uh, security about the, the your paternity you need to know um have some sort of guarantee that your if you're going to have some parental investment you better do it for an offspring that has your genetic material mm. so that's that's important and uh But in that, chimpanzees yeah. that's manifested in a very violent way so whenever for instance another alpha male takes hold of the role so there's an alpha male and that gets it thrown by a beta male and there's a new alpha male in the group what happens very often is that that new alpha male is going to kill the babies of the whole group because why is he going of the, the the sex of the baby i think so i fast or, or, or they only select for the males i don't know that but uh, because it, it would also make sense because you're reducing your competition from a different genetic source it's possible because if it's female then it doesn't matter Sounds reasonable to yeah. me, but I I I don't know. I I just know that one of the main, uh, most important causes of of child mort- mortality mm. in chimpanzees mm. is infanticide by violent alpha males mm. or males in general, mm. possibly. Mm. And of, uh, that's not the case with humans, right? Yeah. And that's no, 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 but, but, but because okay. of that, uh, the females have developed a strategy of promiscuity. Where yeah. they say that come uh, all of you have me so that you're all confused and you don't kill my kids. Yeah. So so that's well, the female well, strategy to uh, get away with propagating her genes, uh, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and of course uh, a lot of uh, mathematicians, bio, bio, mathematical biologists have come up uh, with looking at different species and coming up with what kind of sexual strategies different uh, primates have evolved. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. So yeah. Course, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that, that I want to now put this in contrast to humans. Clearly, it's not the case that in humans a driving or an important cause for child mortality mm. is 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 uh, assassination, is is mm. murdering mm. by by overly jealous or violent mm. males. That's that's not the case. Mm. So over this span of time since we have diverged from chimpanzees yes. which is around 7 million years ago and then there are two obvious things that have changed right one is uh, we moved from being polygynous 
to uh, monogenes? I don't know if we were polygenous. I don't know about primates. I mean, this this we're talking about birds when they were they were. So so you're or... saying that the, the 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 main investment to the offsprings is still significant. In all primates, uh, I don't know if I would make that that claim, but it's. But from polygamy to monogamy, that direction, that trajectory has definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, pair bonding is accompanied by a more equitable parental investment, hmm. which is not perfectly equitable, not even in humans, right? I mean, I think everybody would agree that the females have a, a higher share of parental investment just by the sheer fact that they are the ones that get pregnant and hmm. they are actually hmm. literally hmm. eating. Resources from their own bodies to the bodies of the of the embryos. Yeah, it's not equitable, but, but uh, the pair but it's bonding. much better compared to other primates. Yeah. And, and and here's this is the it's a it's a nice narrative, and I don't want to 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 paint this through modern ideologies of 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 feminism and that kind of thing. But it's hard not to describe the evolutionary history of humans, at least with respect to other primates, as a reflection of some sort of feminism because females ha- are, have been the ones that transgenerationally have, have shaped the behavior me. of males mm. by making them less violent. Mm. And It's still not good enough. So, so if you talk about the modern feminists, they will still complain how uh, about the patriarchy of the world it's, and it's how a curious really ha- the, the males have screwed up most of the things that have been screwed up in this world. It's a curious thing because if you concentrate in a short span of time, in the in a human yeah. lifespan, then it's obvious that there are some still in, in, in inequities sure. in terms of violence. You know, usually, actually, it's controversial to say that in the in the average relationship, there's more violence going from the male to the female than the other way around. Can I make a side note? Uh, yeah. The next few episodes, you'll get more of that. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, so it's, it's a little bit controversial to say that most of the violence in a relationship goes from the male to the female in modern humans. It's just that the violence perpetrated by the male is more dangerous, mm. right? It, it's, possible, dangerous. it's possible that the total net amount of violent incidents, it's not that different in terms of, you know, females slapping or, or doing that kind of thing. But when the males become violent then they, it can get really dangerous and the consequences are much more severe. So mm-hmm. that's that's the disparity there. Um, anyway, now I, I lost track a little bit with what I wanted to say before. Oh, yeah. So over the evolutionary history of, of, of uh, humans, females have selected for less and less violent men. And, uh, and this is reflected not only in behavior, but also in physical traits that we lack in comparison to I other primates. Mean. So, for instance, chimpanzees and gorillas have huge canines. Mm. And they are not only used to fight other males mm. for supremacy. They are also used to subjugate females. Now, like biting them. Yeah, 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 violently. And, and that's more men than women? Uh, like, uh, so male than female in other species, in other primates? Yeah, so, so the, the, the length like the of can- the canines. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Males have sharper mm-hmm. and longer canines than females. Because, of course, there's the other narrative that uh, since we started cooking food, we didn't need canines to tear our food. So yeah, that's also food. important. So, so this was a very adaptive argument that people had. Like, for instance, uh, there is this argument that more, less and less people get their wisdom but, teeth. But the reduction of the canines started way earlier than way that. Earlier yeah, than yeah. so the, the... So so even before Lucy? The we, yeah, knowing how to... So, so Lucy is the first uh, fossil... Australopithecus. Uh, was it, was she the first uh, discovered? At yeah, least, oh, the most of, uh, not the first discovered, but the first mm. e- earlier earlier hominid mm. discovered. One of the yeah, one of the. Now yeah. there are more, mm. uh, and now we even have specimens that might be, you know, like the note in the evolutionary branch where we diverge from chimpanzees. I think it's called. Salehan- and also, we got even further back. Salehanthropus mm. chalensis. I think it's anyway. Anyway, mm. we're again deviating from the yes. issue, but okay, let's just go back a little bit. Yeah. So. This uh, loss of, of or, or taming of violent instincts that has been selected for by females and humans is also reflected on physical traits. As I was saying, the canines basically mm. shorten, and they shorten way before we learn how to use fire and how to mm-hmm. cook. I think Homo erectus was the one that mastered the, the use of fire and learned how to cook. No, but this Homo erectus is recent. Homo, yeah. Homo erectus is 1.5 million years ago or something like that. Mm. Uh, 
from before that, there's a span of like one four four point five million years ago or something like that, or, or time span. You already between see the, the, the different size like, divergence mm-hmm. between uh, uh, humans, the human line, mm-hmm. and the other primates, the chimpanzees, mm-hmm. uh, the other apes. Sorry. Anyway, so so this size reduction in the canines has been going for a long time. Uh, there's other thing, sexual dimorphism, for instance, in terms of body mass, it's it's today males are around fifteen percent mm-hmm. larger than females. Yeah. Also it, in it's terms of muscle. To 30 for, yeah. uh, chimps it's it's and the difference is much larger. And that also has to that also has to do with the yeah. uh, with the uh, sexual behavior of the of the species. Yeah. Uh, so it's much easier for us for so, us, so for another chimps. word for us is that uh, in a in a very crude way women have domesticated men. No, yeah, I mean, uh, in in an evolutionary time scale, there is no question about that. Mm. So, if, if that is that is the, the the definition of domestication, of course, yeah, <laughs> uh, taming taming an animal down is domestication. Then yeah. Yes, but mm. but there are other. It gets complicated when you look at other parts of the body, mm. um, and that's where speculations, uh, a lot of speculative hypotheses have come in, right? Yeah, because you look at, for instance, because of course we have also shaped uh, woman uh, features also physically, yeah, physically uh, as well as emotionally, behavior, 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 for sure, yeah, yeah. Because as soon as pair bonding comes into the picture and the amount of parental investment that is needed from the man, there is selection from the man's side as well, uh, mm. male side as well. Uh, so of course, uh, yeah. The the shaping, I would argue, from male to female, has been more in the direction of physicality, right? You think so? Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. in terms of behavior. I, I'm not saying that no, but uh, it's, it's so, more so, pronounced. So, 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 so um, uh, when uh, like like for instance, the, the size uh, of like, like for example, like you, uh, if I ask you to look, think of someone who is hot, uh, you have a certain image, and when you think of someone who is beautiful. Uh, you have a certain... Uh, but there will be overlap, for sure. There will be overlap, and that is the physical feature. But with the beauty thing, you are I mean, getting the behavioral aspect in as well. Not automatically. Not automatically. I think my, my first impulse would be that there's a huge over. I would... In, the image that would come to my mind when you make me think of, of, of both of those categories, somebody that's hot and somebody that's beautiful, there would be a lot of significant overlap in terms of physicality mm. I would say and and that's also reflective of the fact that as I said in terms of sexual selection the action of males towards females in, in, in humans has been more towards shaping their physical form than their behavioral form I'm not saying that there's zero molding of, of behavioral characteristics uh, through sexual selection from mm. male to females uh. but, the, but the physical is very 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 obvious Physical is obvious, but but there is also but, but a behavior. But I'm very significant yeah. because think about breasts. <laughs> I mean, I don't need to yeah, sure. force breasts you to think about those, that. But uh, breasts and uh, butt. <laughs> but, but I'm going to focus they, on the breasts. Kind of Accentuate. You know, right, this yeah. is for purely scientific purposes. Mm. Focus on the breasts. And you're getting both your hands up as well. They should have done that. Okay. <laughs> thank you for letting me know. Yeah. That was good to... Good to for that, thank you for that remark. Uh, uh, okay. Focus on the breasts. Uh, and realize that among all the mammals that exist in, in Earth, there are how many species, numbers of species, I don't remember now, but there's a, it's a vast amount of mammals, mammals. Humans are unique in the sense that females are the only ones that keep enlarged breasts, regardless of whether they are in yeah, estrus so, period yeah. or not. So, so and that's not an entirely indicator. the action of males, hundred percent. It is nothing. It's nothing else. It has. It's completely decoupled from natural selection, mm. and even the hourglass shape. I mean, there's a correlation between uh, having a reservoir of, of fat and health because fat is gonna be necessary to withdraw resources. Why? Well, because, just, but, no, no, just, that, to finish, um, just to finish. Uh, just to finish. Yeah. Just to finish that yeah. that line. So there's a correlation. There's something Saharian about. Females having more body fat than males because they're going to need resources for when they, they are uh, pregnant. But it doesn't have to be in this particular uh, distribution so as to form this, this typical, you know, this prototypical hourglass mm-hmm. shape. The distribution and the aesthetic distribution of fat in the female body 
it's a preference of males. It doesn't help with with uh, in, increasing their fitness to have. So, so, so you think uh, that fat tissue on the ass and in the breast is uh, is the actual of sexual preference of bountiness and not. Uh, there is again so there but is then, uh, hmm. so there is a correlation it is true this this actually aligns nicely with fisher's ideas it might have the accumulation of fat in female bodies it might have at its root uh, a utilitarian reason you know a fitness reason it's important mm-hmm. it's more important for females to have certain uh, reservoirs of fat in their bodies because they're going to need resources for when they are pregnant but the distribution and the, even yeah, the exaggeration. So, yeah. The sculpting that we have done over everything. Yeah, then, then it's become gradually more and more decoupled from natural selection. And aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic sense becomes more and more important in determining the distribution of fat in the female body. So males have shaped the female body over generations. And for sure, also their behavior. But in terms of behavior, behavioral shaping, the, the action of females to males has been, at least in humans, much more significant. They changed us from being these so little so chimpanzees that are murdering babies. So, 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 so what do we select for? Uh, like, what do women select for? Like, like Physically? What, no, no, behaviorally. Humor? I, I, I would say... It Leadership qualities? Case. Sorry? Leadership qualities? It's, it seems to be attractive. Uh, um, uh, entrepreneurship yeah yeah but th- there are certain mm-hmm. features that are that show a correlation between behavior and, and physicality for instance female t- t- tend to prefer pronounced uh, jaw lines mm-hmm. but not so pronounced and also they tend to prefer uh, facial hair but not these huge beards you know a certain stuff so not Jesus did. no 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 and, and also not like muscular type of but bodies, somewhere in between. but yeah. not hugely muscular mm-hmm. terminator or something like that. Hair, but and not that's, so much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so there, so that's and that and that's related to the amount of testosterone in the female, in the males, in the males' bodies, right? So they do like a certain amount of testosterone enough mm-hmm. to to be translated in mm-hmm. prototypical male characteristics, yeah, yeah, yeah. but not so much of it mm-hmm. because when it's too much. These, these features that otherwise might be desirable become too exaggerated and they also seem to indicate a certain degree of males being too domineering or too, too, too violent. And that's correlated to testosterone. Testosterone, when it's in abundance running in the, in the, in the, in the bloodstream of males, mm-hmm. makes them more violent. And that's not desirable from a female, yeah, female sure. point of view. So there's a, it's, it's not completely disentangled certain physical characteristics mm-hmm. with behavioral characteristics. So so, it's, be- it's complicated. so 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 the behavioral character because you are talking about only physical traits at the moment. Uh, but there you see the correlation with behavior, so, right? So so let, let's talk about the behavioral characteristics mm-hmm. that uh, they are selected for. It's only uh, related with violence. I would say reduction pretty, of violence. I don't think it's only, but I would say I, I would say that this, that's the more significant dimension so that, that is the thing that is very obviously visible. So as I say, yeah. it's, it, it, you're not talking about things like. Uh, uh, you're talking about uh, um, like how aggressive in nature we are. Uh, they have kind of kind of tuned that, but not uh, other features that uh, like humor. Like take that one for like, example. Like like humor, like leadership, like um, intellectual uh, prowess. Like, yeah, yeah, intellectual prowess. No, no, take this. No, no, but but that's where I want to talk about the uh, the thing. Like so, so they've kind of selected. So, so you you believe that there is some uh, sexual sure. selection involved Absolutely. in trying to yeah. get those things into prominence, yeah. Uh, and that hasn't happened the other way around. I think so, but I think in a less in a more moderate way. So, so that's a very controversial statement. It is a very controversial yeah. statement, but so that's but that exactly doesn't mean the statement I wanted to. No, use. no, but 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 no, it is, it is, yeah. but it's not. So, so you think these uh, features have not been uh, selected for significantly in women? No, okay. Let, let me let me rephrase that because mm. it's more nuanced than that. So, human sexual behavior is complicated. Many times, it's done just because of pleasure, mm. right? 
and few times it's done because you actually want to engage in a durable pair bonding with that other person. Mm. Now, for the first kind of sexual behavior, which is uh, epitomized by the one night stand, nothing really matters. I know what you're talking about. I'm (laughs) not familiar with this concept, but let me explain it to you. You meet with a woman for one night, you have a sexual intercourse, and then you never see each other again. Okay? Uh, Crash course and one night stands. Uh, uh, nothing matters. No, nothing really, really matters very much. It, it, what, what matters is this to have this click of attraction, which is very, mm. that is very physical. It's very, it's very physical. But even I would argue, and it will be against, again, controversial that from the female side, there still needs to be some other thing either. Like a certain hookup that is not only physical. That tends to be the case. And I'm, 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 what, the reason why I say this more than my own ideas is because I've heard it um, from many different uh, women that it's not just about having this rush of physical attraction, that usually there's another thing that also filters through. And that in the, is uh, the much more subdued uh, in men. I think for males it kind of doesn't matter. At least in this type of sexual interactions. It just doesn't matter. For, for a uh... No. That's that's the one. That's the 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 the, the, the average tendency. That's a, yeah, I would say yes. I would say yes. Now, for pair bonding, for engaging in a serious quote unquote serious relationship, then it's a totally different different story. Then you select like even in consider even even I'm not saying that we have like this switch uh, males. I'm talking about males now, where we before. Or from the beginning, when we start interacting with a female, we are thinking, and we have this romantic uh, purpose in mind, we have the switch on, like, okay, this is just for fun. Okay, now, now I press the switch, and this is going, this is for a serious uh, relationship. You know, this is an unstable kind of a situation. It's not so predictable, not at least not in that simplistic way. So, whatever it is, that eventually leads to the consolidation of a more robust pair bonding. Uh, it takes in, it, it takes into account not just physical traits but also behavioral traits from both sides, and also from the from mm. the from the masculine side, and not just behavioral. Behavioral might be too general, too broad. Uh, talking about more specific traits like mm. a certain sense of humor and certain level of intellect mm. and so on and so forth. And it's so much mm. that that if you look again. We talk about this before in the podcast, and if you look at the distribution of uh, intelligence, let's say as measured by IQ, there's a huge overlap, right? It's not the case that males have selected for dumber and dumber and dumber females, because that's not reflected in the in the data. So exactly. It's also no, so that, that was the point I was trying yeah. to get you to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you How long do have we been talking about? One and a half hours or something. Yeah. So we should try to wrap it up. Uh, and I think we are in a good way with it because we started off by basically questioning whether physical traits in humans are totally socially constructed mm-hmm. or uh, whether there are some physical uh, naturalistic roots to it yeah, through someone's... some selection. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think this... Precisely, yeah. is a good way to... It's a little bit frustrating because there's a lot yeah. to, to more to dig in into this mm-hmm. topic. But well, I mean, it's been one and a half hours, so yeah. it has to, has to stop at, a, yeah. at some point. Which, at that mm-hmm. point, has to come. I think we, we, we can come back and engage in the same conversation or take take it off from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because I wanted to get into mm-hmm. stuff like... Uh, sexual deviance. Se- yeah, sexual deviance and yeah. sexual fantasy. No, 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 because that, that's a very important... Even though a extremely sensitive topic, uh, but we do. But it's very closely inter- connected yeah. to this. So, so I, I think we'll have a connecting episode very soon. Yeah, on that. yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, cool. All right. So with that, we say adios. Goodbye. Adios. See the next time. Yeah. Cheers. If you like what we do. Please help us continue doing it simply by subscribing to our Podbean or YouTube channel, following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, visiting us on our website tillthebottom.com or simply spreading the word. Find the links in the description below. The music you hear in the background is a track called Face to Face performed by Daphne. Thank you for listening and until next time.
Cheers.